kind of look at ultrasound as my bread and butter, and there are images that I obtain every day as I work. And I'm very used to it, and I've gotten good at it. And as we scan the things that we see usually or normally, we actually get better and better at scanning. But what if you go to a part of the world that has no bread and butter? What if you're served Hansen or Ugali, as you would see in East Africa, or in Jera, as perhaps in Ethiopia, pounded yams, as we see all over West Africa, Ruti that you would see in South Asia, or tortillas, or yuca that you would see in populations in the southern part of South America. Are you ready for these other diets from an ultrasound perspective? What if you're served echinococcus, or schistosomiasis, or extrapulmonary tuberculosis? What if you're asked to evaluate an abscess where somebody says something's moving inside the abscess? Will you be ready? Are you ready to taste something a little bit different than your normal bread and butter? Well, I'm Dr. Ted Kuhn, and I'd like to talk to you a little bit about ultrasound and tropical infectious diseases. Maybe a topic where we may never see any of these diseases our entire life, or if we travel into the developing world, we may be entering somebody else's territory where these diseases are very prominent and the ultrasound findings are actually quite typical. Well, there are a lot of diseases or illnesses that occur in the developing world or in tropical countries. Let's see if we can kind of break them into categories to make them more understandable for us. Let's make the first category uh, the category where ultrasound is the accepted or established uh, diagnostic or treatment modality. In other words, ultrasound alone can either make the diagnosis or strongly suggest the diagnosis or make a major impact in the treatment or follow-up of that disease. The second category, let's make those where ultrasound actually can substantially decrease the differential diagnosis or can suggest an illness, but you need some other test to make the diagnosis. In other words, a laboratory, a laboratory test or something else. The third category, perhaps one of the most interesting, is uh, we just don't know. Either we've done a lot of scanning and we can't discern a pattern in the disease that makes it different from other diseases, or there may actually be diseases where nobody's actually tried to scan, and uh, we don't actually know whether you can make the diagnosis on that disease because either there's no published data or we have no personal experience with it. Let me also suggest a disclaimer in that uh, these diseases are actually fluid. As we continue our experience in scanning, we actually move one disease from one category to another, perhaps one where we listed it as number two as an adjunct. Now we know that actually diagnosis can, uh, ultrasound can make the diagnosis or, or vice versa. We put it into category one and we realize that there are times that the disease cannot be diagnosed by ultrasound and we put it in the adjunctive category. This is also not a um, complete list of all the diseases that you'll see in the developing world. This is only a beginning. Uh, we can't, uh, in one hour lecture, uh, list all the diseases in the developing world. So if your favorite disease or something that you're interested in is, in is not here, uh, please excuse us and we might include it later or you can actually write to us or communicate with us and suggest that uh, we put it in our uh, diagnostic categories. Well, let's begin by looking at the first category. In other words, those diseases where the diagnosis can be made or where ultrasound is the primary modality for either diagnosis, treatment, or follow-up. Well, let's start with cystic echinococcal disease. Now, I will admit that this is certainly a complicated disease to start off with, but it's also a disease where ultrasound has had an incredible impact on the diagnosis, treatment, follow-up, and perioperative evaluation of the disease. Uh, the ultrasound has been able to see whether the lesion is intact. Is it unilocular? In other words, is it one, just one big cyst? And if it is, perhaps it would be something that could be treated by aspiration or by pair. Has it ruptured? Or is it complicated with many daughter cysts? Or is it calcified? And the calcification usually means that it's inactive. Ultrasound can also identify the extent of the lesions in reference to other organs and vital structures and identify the presence of additional or occult lesions. The WHO, in cooperation with the International Working Group on Cystic Echinococcus, has proposed a six-tiered categorization of echinococcal disease based on its ultrasound appearance. The first is CL, and CL means it's cystic lesion. Maybe it is a uh, echinococcal lesion, maybe it isn't. It's just difficult to tell, and you can't make the diagnosis without some other modality. The CE1 
uh, in the CE2 are active lesions. And if you look at the slide starting from your left, that's a CL. And the one in the middle is actually a CE1, which shows granular scoliosis in the center and a thickened border. And this is actually diagnostic for uh, conococcus. The CE2, which demonstrates the thickened border, or the um, CE3, which shows the classic water lily sign, which is a transitional type of aconococcus. In other words, this could be an aconococcal cyst that has been treated and is in the process of becoming a CE4 or CE5 and is inactive, or it may actually reactivate and become a CE2. And those are the third and fourth uh, pictures on your slide. And the CE4s, which are at the bottom of the slide and to your right, are inactive lesions. In other words, these are ones that really don't need to be treated. They're already uh, resolved or dead, and uh, you can ignore those or just follow those with follow-up ultrasounds. In the previous slide, we mentioned that ultrasound is the major diagnostic modality for diagnosing cystic aconococcus, especially in resource-limited settings, but it is not the only one. CT can also be used and defines aconococcal disease quite nicely. This is a CT of the abdomen showing the liver with a very complicated multilocular aconococcal cyst of the liver. Because of its relatively low cost and portability, ultrasound has been found to be ideal for screening at-risk populations for hydatid disease. Because most infections are unilocular, meaning involving only one cyst, and the majority of them, 65% or more, occur in the liver, a sonographer can quickly and easily scan a large number of patients per day looking for cystic aconococcus. The picture here involves one of my colleagues who is screening patients in Tibet, and several sonographers working together can screen several hundred patients a day. Schistosomiasis is one of the most prevalent helminthic infections in the world. The World Health Organization estimates that there are about 207 million people currently infected with schistosomiasis, and there are about 700 million around the world at risk. That's one-seventh or one-eighth of the world's population. So it seems reasonable to assume that when you travel to other parts of the world, that you may indeed encounter schistosomiasis. Schistosomiasis is really a worldwide problem. Eastern South America, particularly the coast of Brazil, is infected. Most of the middle of Africa, from a band from the east the whole way to the west, has schistosomiasis. The Middle East has schistosomiasis. And schistosoma japonicum is not uncommon in Southeast Asia, in East Asia, and the Philippines. In this next segment, we'll look at schistosomiasis and look at some of its characteristics. There's only one question that needs to be thought through at this point. Why do they call it pipe stem fibrosis? So let's think about that a little bit. Now let's look at another disease that portable ultrasound can make a significant impact on diagnosis, management, and treatment, and that is schistosomiasis. Let me mention that there are several different forms of schistosomiasis, and we're only going to talk about the chronic form. There's circarial dermatitis, which is a pruritic papular rash found on the skin exposed to circaria containing waters. As far as I'm aware, there is no ultrasound findings in circarial dermatitis. There's also acute schistosomiasis, or Kadayama fever, uh, which develops in some people who are heavily exposed to schistosoma, japonicum, and mansoni, and occasionally in hematobium. But again, as far as I'm aware, there are no ultrasound findings in acute schistosomiasis. So we really want to focus on the chronic schistosomiasis as seen in endemic areas. It's less dramatic than acute schistosomiasis, but it's progressive illness, repeated from prolonged tissue injury and fibrosis from the dip deposition of parasite eggs in the affected organs. The intestine and liver are affected by uh, schistosoma mansoni, japonicum, and makanji, and intercalculatum, and the bladder, ureters, and kidneys for schistosoma hematobium. In mansoni, makanji, and japonicum infections, a significant number of parasite eggs are retained in the body and travel to the liver via the portal circulation. These eggs lodge in the presinusoidal radicals of the portal, portal vein, where they elicit a granulomatous reaction. Thus, venous flow is affected, first by the presence of a living egg and the surrounding granuloma formation, and later by local scar formation resulting from fibrosis.
The net result is portal vein hypertension and the development of portosystemic collateral blood flow. This is the classification of schistosomiasis based on periportal fibrosis and thickening that has been adopted by the WHO. As you can see, it progresses from A through Z. A is a normal finding. X, Y, and Z are other liver disorders, including uh, fatty infiltrate uh, and cirrhosis, as mentioned previously. I do want to call your attention to B, diffuse echogenic fo foci, which is also referred to as a starry sky appearance of the liver. The reason it's important for us to focus on this is that sometimes this is also applied to patients with hepatitis. Although hepatitis usually results in no detectable sonographic abnormalities, in some patients, actually in the minority of patients, it can cause increased echogenicity of the portal triads, which appear as small bright areas on views of the liver in the periphery. And this appearance has also been called a starry sky appearance. So when we refer to star starry sky, let's remember that other things besides grade B schistosomiasis can be referred to as starry sky so that we don't get confused. You don't need to measure the periportal fibrosis with your calipers to classify these into category B through F. You can also recognize the patterns grossly when you begin to look at the ultrasounds and you see them more frequently. The chronic form of fibrosis in schistosoma japonicum actually looks quite different than the periportal fibrosis and thickening that we see with other forms of schistosomiasis like Mansoni. Schistosoma japonicum is found in Southeast Asia and South Asia and is endemic in many areas. As you can see from this image and clip, it's more of a reticulated pattern rather than pipe stem fibrosis and thickening as we see in the other forms. I think the life cycle of schistosomiasis is always somewhat complicated and difficult to remember. Trying to make it a little bit easy, remember that the adult worms will release eggs. The eggs will go one of two or three places in the body, as in the case of Mansonide and Japonicum. They'll go in the periportal areas of the liver uh, or in the mesenteric circulation around the bowel and rectum. And in case of hematobium, they will go in the venous plexus around the bladder. If persons infected with schistosomiasis either defecate or urinate around water with the appropriate snail hosts, the myricidia will release after approximately one to two hours uh, in an appropriate environment, and the snails will take them up. And the snails will hold them for several months, eventually releasing forktail cercaria. The cercaria penetrate the skin of people who are washing and bathing in the water, and the whole system repeats itself. This is a good way to remember it. I'm looking at a microscope under high power, and what you see here are flame cells in a schistosoma mansoni egg. And that flame cell means that the egg is indeed uh, alive and infective. The previous photograph was taken with my iPhone through the ocular of the microscope where I was watching the flame cell in the schistosoma mansoni egg. I took a little bit of water from the tap and placed it on the microscope slide and literally within five minutes we hatched a myricidium. The myricidium, uh, if it were around appropriate water with the correct snail, could infect that snail, would live in the snail for one to two months and eventually release a fork tail cercaria. Those cercaria can penetrate intact skin within one to two seconds, uh, initiate an acute uh, infection with schistosomiasis. A couple of months ago, I was working in a West African country that indeed is endemic for schistosomiasis. But according to all the maps and the local people, I was in an area of the country in a tropical jungle area that harbored no schistosomiasis. The gentleman in this picture was my neighbor, and he's shown here with his beautiful family. And he actually helped me considerably in negotiating with the village elders for providing of medical care. He told me that for the last two years, he had been having increasing right upper quadrant pain especially when he exercised, and it becomes so severe that it was impacting his life and his ability to work. At first, I didn't think about schistosomiasis because, again, we were not in a schistosomiasis area. But as I talked to him, he told me that he occasionally fished, and he did go into those areas some 30 to 50 mile distance from where we were, and he fished by net, so that meant that he waded into the water. 
I obtained this ultrasound on him and I thought that it was um, kind of subtle, but as you can see that there are some echogenic foci uh, around the portal triads and I classified this as schistosomiasis classification B. I decided to go ahead and treat him with praziquantel, thinking that we had very little to lose. Two days later, I found him running laps around an area where I was staying in the village. And I asked him what he was doing. And he said since he had taken the praziquantel that he felt so much better that he was able to exercise without pain. Now, I honestly don't know whether praziquantel works that fast. But I think the point here is, is that if you're thinking about schistosomiasis and there's any question about it from the ultrasound, Praziquantel is a benign drug and you can go ahead and treat them and it sometimes will very rapidly reverse the symptomatology from acute schistosomiasis and it's certainly a worthwhile endeavor. Schistosoma hematobium looks a little bit different. As we mentioned previously, schistosoma hematobium eggs seem to gather around the bladder and the venous plexus around the bladder causing chronic thickening of the bladder and these kind of polypoid lesions that you see in this picture. Schistosoma hematobium can not only cause polypoid lesions in the bladder, but also encourages chronic bacterial overgrowth and chronic bacterial infection, causing thickening walls, as in this patient. There's also a relationship between chronic infection and schistosoma hematobium and squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder. At this point, hopefully you don't need a reminder not to go swimming in fresh water in schistosomiasis areas of Asia and Africa. I was in Mali along the Niger River watching these boys jumping in the Niger River on a particularly hot day thinking of how refreshing it would be. However, the Niger River is well known to harbor schistosomiasis and as I watched these boys I thought to myself, well, I guess I'll see you the next time I'm here. The next topic where ultrasound can make the diagnosis is in liver abscesses. Now most of the time these liver abscesses are in the right lobe of the liver and oftentimes the patient is quite ill or has a right upper quadrant uh, mass or fluctuance that you can feel on physical exam. If you see something like this on ultrasound, I suggest that you put color Doppler on it to make sure it has no internal echoes like would be the case in a tumor or soft tissue mass. All abscesses will not have internal echoes. You may actually even see some swirling. There has been a lot of discussion as to whether you can differentiate between an amoebic abscess and a pyogenic abscess, and at this point, as far as I'm aware, there's no distinguishing characteristics that would help you discern one from the other. That's really going to be a bacteriologic diagnosis. This video clip is from another patient with a liver abscess, and as expected, it's in the right lobe of the liver. If you look carefully at it, you can also see that there is a fairly substantial pleural effusion next to the abscess. I don't recall whether this was amoebic or pyogenic, but obviously an abscess of this size needs to be surgically drained. This is the same patient after drainage of the abscess, and you can see that there is a drain into the liver abscess. There's also a chest tube in place. I was called in at this point to do an ultrasound on the liver to see if the abscess had residual pus or whether it had been adequately surgically drained. As you can imagine from looking at this patient, uh, there's almost no place on this abdomen to put your ultrasound probe to scan the patient. This is a large splenic abscess. You have to look quite closely to see the edge of the abscess, and it's demarcated by the red lines. It's actually so big that you could almost miss it if you were just scanning casually. This is tropical pyomyositis in a child. For some reason, these occur frequently in the developing world and in tropical areas and almost never in the developed world and in temperate climates. Usually they're caused by either staph or strep and they act somewhat different than a normal uh, abscess. They often have a brawny or brown discoloration on the surface rather than a red or violaceous color. They also are not warm to touch and they can go on for several weeks before they're discovered. Oftentimes they're in the extremities and they actually can occasionally be bilateral as well. If there's any question about the diagnosis, obviously an ultrasound probe over the area of interest will demonstrate what looks like a normal abscess. I remember the first time I found one of these in a young man who was in his thigh and I did an IND on it and was amazed to find uh, over a gallon of pus 
localized in the muscle. You might be a little surprised that I've included rheumatic fever and rheumatic valvular heart disease in a talk about tropical infectious diseases. However, rheumatic fever has become very uncommon in the West, yet it's still very common in the developing countries or developing nations. The incidence of rheumatic fever in the United States is only 0.25 per thousand people. If you look at the statistics from WHO uh, in India, it's 14 per thousand people. And in Southern Africa, Mozambique, for example, it's 30 per thousand people. You see, rheumatic fever has become a problem with impoverished people in large cities in developing countries. And that's why we address it from a perspective of tropical infectious diseases. There are rheumatogenic strains of strep, and people think that there's been a variation in the strep that we see in Western countries. But the rheumatogenic strains of strep are still common around the world, and they seem to react with the heart, and particularly with heart valves. There may be several reasons why it's uncommon to see rheumatic fever in Western countries today. We have improved socioeconomic conditions, and we also have been treating strep with antibiotics. 85% of all mitral stenosis around the world is caused by rheumatic fever, and rheumatic fever damages the mitral valve 75% of the time uh, during rheumatic fever. So the involvement of valves is very common. So we'll look at it from the perspective of a tropical infectious disease. As I just mentioned, the mitral valve is the most common valve affected by rheumatic valvular heart disease, followed by the aortic valve. Now this is a chronic progressive disease. Most people will be exposed to strep early on in life, during early middle school years, and be asymptomatic for 15 to 20 years or even longer. But once they develop symptoms, they rapidly progress. And the fatality of rheumatic valvular heart disease is based on the New York Heart Association classification for severity of symptoms in congestive heart failure. So once you're severely symptomatic, your survival at 10 years is less than 10%. And again, remember that this is a disease of young people in their most productive time of life, in their early 20s or early 30s. This is a case in point. This is a young man that I have been following for the last several years. He lives in a rural community of West Africa, is very poor, and is a subsistence farmer. His age is about 30 years old. He has come to me for the last several years complaining of increasing shortness of breath and dyspnea on exertion, and he's concerned because he can't work all day in the fields like he used to be able to do to support himself and his family. If you look at the parasternal long view of his echocardiogram, you can easily see that the mitral valve is thickened. You can also see the characteristic doming of the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve in diastole, which indicates mitral stenosis. Also, if you look carefully at the aortic valve, you can see that the aortic valve is also thickened, and it's not uncommon to have more than one valve involved in rheumatic valvular heart disease. The mitral is the most common, followed secondarily by the aortic valve. There's also poor opening of the mitral valve, as you can see on this parasternal long view, which is why he's been having shortness of breath and dyspnea on exertion and can explain his symptoms. This is the apical four-chamber view of the same man that we spoke about in the previous slide. You can see that there's a thickened mitral valve, and you can see that doming once again, uh, the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. But there are also some more ominous findings here as well. You can see that the left atrium is enlarged, and there's some spontaneous contrast in the left atrium. Even more importantly, if you look at the right atrium, you can see that's enlarged, which leads me to think that there's substantial pulmonary hypertension. And even if this young man were to get an operation to replace his mitral valve, he may continue to have significant and severe pulmonary hypertension, which affects his ability to survive. I don't know what his survival is over the next 10 years, but it is certainly not a good survival rate. I'm sure it's probably less than 10%. And every year as I travel to West Africa, I wonder if he will be there when I get there. This is an issue that I did not want to pass up while speaking about abnormal valves. This is thankfully not the young man that I saw on the previous slide, but this is an abnormal mitral valve with endocarditis. Now you're going to have to look very, very carefully to see the little vegetation on the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. It's quite hard to see and it only shows up for a second or so and I apologize for that. But it's good to remember that abnormal valves attract bacteria and endocarditis is not uncommon in abnormal valves 
Therefore, it's not uncommon in the developing world when we have abnormal valves. I also wanted to mention that this young man and many others that I've seen with abnormal valves have chronic malaria. Now, this is not his slide, but this is a slide of falciparum malaria. You see a nice ring form with the Maurer clefts, and if you look quite carefully, you may see an accolade um, or an applique form indicating falciparum malaria. Every time I've seen this young man in West Africa, he's had a 2 or 3 percent chronic parasitemia with falciparum. We know that malnourished children have chronic bacteremias, and I also think that children who have chronic malaria also are susceptible to chronic uh, bacteremia. And I wonder if there is a relationship between bacteremia and chronic malaria, which increases the incidence of endocarditis and all these abnormal valves that we see in poor communities throughout the world. Endomyocardial fibrosis is a disease of young children in Africa. It's a disease we're trying to learn more and more about and still have an incomplete understanding. It seems to be related to hypereosinophilia in children with uh, overwhelming helminthic infections. It's a fatal disease. Uh, the children actually look quite ill and that's where the uh, phrase comes, a potato on a stick, because they have uh, general wasting uh, but have some edema or ascites of the abdomen. However, the ultrasound findings are actually quite characteristic with fibrosis usually starting at the apex of the left ventricle and proceeding until the entire ventricle is filled with fibrotic tissue. Patients with chronic active hepatitis B and C are known to progress on from chronic hepatitis to cirrhosis and some will develop hepatocellular carcinoma. The usual course of events is this develops over a period of many years often as many as 20 years. However, in persons who are co-infected with HIV, this course of infection going from hepatitis to cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma can be shortened substantially to as little as two or three years. In many parts of the world where hepatitis is common and HIV is also common, patients are screened by ultrasound for the development of hepatocellular carcinoma every six months to a year. This is obviously what we hope to avoid. This is a patient with HIV and chronic hepatitis who developed a large hepatic mass. You can see from the color flow Doppler that there is color within the mass, which makes it vascular. There's also edema around the outside, which we call a reverse target sign, which is almost always indicative of malignancy. This is a patient that was referred in for an ultrasound in South America. The patient had had right upper quadrant pain, tenderness over the liver to palpation, low-grade fevers, and a marked eosinophilia. The patient had been referred in as a quote-unquote rule-out parasitic disease. On the ultrasound, what you see is a small hypodense area adjacent to the diaphragm and to Glisson's capsule. You can also notice small hypodense areas that are somewhat serpiginous emanating from the hypodense area and proceeding toward the portal vein and common bile duct. This would be very common for fasciola, and I suggested that fasciola was the diagnosis in this patient. We did do an ELISA for fasciola, which was positive, although I must admit also that Toxicara will do this as well as other visceral larva migrans. If you have the ability to scan over a period of several days, you might save these images and look at the small serpiginous hypodense areas, which may indeed move as the parasite moves toward the common bile duct. Now in the end, the patient was treated, did get better, and we never had a tissue diagnosis to confirm that this was indeed fasciola. However, this ultrasound in this picture would be quite common for fasciola hepatica of the liver. This ultrasound is a lot easier to see than the previous one. The fasciola hepatica actually make their way through the liver toward the common bile duct where they live. They also generate eggs which pass through the sphincter of odi into the stool and can occasionally be found in a stool exam and are quite definitive uh, for the diagnosis. Sometimes the fasciola will pass into the gallbladder and can give symptoms of biliary colic or cholecystitis. These are small disc-like lesions that float around in the gallbladder and are fairly distinctive. If you look at the video clip, you can actually see the fasciola swimming in the gallbladder. It kind of has a falling leaf type of a motion and is quite specific for fasciola. Several slides ago, we mentioned visceral larva migraines when we were talking about fasciola hepatica. And the 
life cycle of the worm is somewhat similar to the liver fluke in that it penetrates a small bowel wall and travels throughout the body, sometimes lodging in the liver, the lung, or the brain, and occasionally in the eye. If the worm migrates to the eye, it's called ocular larva migrans, and there may not be systemic manifestations. These are children that generally have leukocoria at about age four or five or six and develop blindness over a period of two or three months. There's also a history of contact with either dogs or cats. Now in this image what you see is a granulomatous or fibrotic reaction in the eye which causes traction on the um, retina causing the retinal detachment. You also notice on the right side, your right, that there's synechiae throughout the eye. Now sometimes early on in ocular larva migraines you can confuse this with retinoblastoma but the literature says that up to 95 percent of retinoblastomas will have calcifications and virtually none of ocular larva migraines will have calcifications. So if you see calcifications, you should be thinking more of retinoblastoma than of ocular larva migraines. Also, retinoblastoma generally occurs earlier on in children, usually at age one or two, and sometimes even prenatal uh, can be diagnosed. However, the ocular larva migraines occurs later on in children at the age of four or five or six after they've had time to contact uh, dogs and the blindness develops over a period of two or three months. When in doubt, you can certainly do a serology, and uh, both of these children who had ocular larva migraines uh, in these images had positive serologies for Doxotera. Now this is the ultrasound diagnosis of myiasis, and we're looking specifically at the bot fly and the tumbu fly. They have a little bit different life cycles, but the end result seems to be the same. The eggs uh, get under the skin and develop into a larva and show up as what looks like an abscess, but people will describe what they feel like is motion or movement within the abscess. There's always a little hole in the center where there's a respiratory spicular respiratory tubule from the larvae sticking out into the skin. If you put color flow Doppler on the larva, you'll see that it has twinkle, which represents the respiratory cycle of the larva. This is a video clip I got from one of my friends and colleagues using a linear transducer over a bot fly and power Doppler demonstrating the respiratory movement and cycle within the uh, larva. Now let's take a look at the next category, which is where ultrasound is an adjunct to the diagnosis and treatment of certain diseases. This means that with ultrasound, you can't absolutely make the diagnosis. You can certainly decrease the differential, but you'll need ultrasound plus something else to help you with the diagnosis. And we'll really look at three different things. The first is the diagnosis of extrapulmonary tuberculosis or disseminated tuberculosis by using the FASH, F-A-S-H exam. The second is screening for complications of American trypanosomiasis. And the third is use of ultrasound as an adjunct in the diagnosis and treatment and progression of hemorrhagic fevers. The FASH exam, or focused assessment with sonography for HIV TB, was really developed for the resource limited setting where the sputum smears are negative for TB and the diagnosis is in question. Now, any of us who have worked in HIV or TB settings know that the sputum smear by carbofusion is very limited in its ability to diagnose TB. In patients with proven pulmonary tuberculosis, the smear can be positive only 40 or 50 percent of the time. That means half the patients with pulmonary tuberculosis will be smear negative. You can increase the rate of positivity by using fluorescence, and if you use fluorescence in concentrated sputum, you can actually get about 60% of those patients with known pulmonary tuberculosis to have positive fluorescent smears. On the other side of that, that means that 40 or 50% of patients with known tuberculosis will be smear negative. And the diagnosis is often even more difficult in patients with HIV. The FASH exam was developed for resource poor settings where there is no culture and there are no other immunologic tests for TB to narrow the diagnosis and the differential diagnosis to make treatment more plausible and possible. The FASH exam was really developed for use in HIV patients where the smear was negative for tuberculosis and there's been no other pathologic way to diagnose extrapulmonary tuberculosis or 
disseminated tuberculosis. And it's been suggested that its use is best in places where the HIV rate is greater than 5% among tuberculosis patients. The FASH exam really focuses on the ultrasound of what we know about pulmonary and extrapulmonary tuberculosis. We know that pulmonary tuberculosis and extrapulmonary tuberculosis often causes effusions. And these effusions can be pleural, they can be pericardial, or they can be abdominal, like acidic fluid. And oftentimes they're fibrinous. We also know that disseminated tuberculosis causes abnormal lymphadenopathy. And the FASH exam scans those areas, particularly the periaortic area, which is a site that is commonly involved in extrapulmonary tuberculosis with lymphadenopathy. The FASH exam also is used to detect focal lesions in the liver and spleen, which suggest a disseminated tuberculosis. And we'll see images of small microabscesses of the spleen and liver in miliary TB or disseminated tuberculosis, especially in the immunocompromised or HIV positive host. So we mentioned there are really three parts of the FASH exam. The first part of the FASH exam is to look for effusions, pleural, pericardial, and abdominal. The second part is to look for abnormal lymphadenopathy. And the third part is to look for those microabscesses in the liver and spleen. So we'll begin by looking at the first topic first, which are effusions. The FASH exam was actually founded and popularized by one of my friends, Dr. Tom Heller, and he published a little booklet that can walk you through the steps of the FASH exam. You can get this booklet from Teaching Aids at Low Cost, and it actually has included in a DVD with all his images that you can use to look at the images as you begin to learn the FASH exam. This is an ultrasound of the left upper quadrant, and what you see on your right is a picture of the spleen covered by the diaphragm. Toward your left, you'll see a relatively hypoechoic area, which is a pleural effusion. Now, if you look carefully with respirations, you'll see that pleural effusion has fibrous strands within it, which makes it a fibrinous pleural effusion. Now, the most common cause for a fibrinous pleural effusion is actually tuberculosis. There are other things that will do it, for example, a bacterial infection or empyema. But in the right setting, in a high incidence area for tuberculosis, this is most likely caused by pulmonary tuberculosis. This is a complex collection of fluid in the abdomen. And what you see is a hyperechoic acidic fluid uh, or abdominal fluid with fibrinous strands in it. So we would call this a fibrinous acidic fluid. Now, extrapulmonary tuberculosis or disseminated per tuberculosis can certainly cause this fibrinous acidic fluid. However, infections of the abdomen with pyogenic bacteria or abscess formation from bacteria can also cause a very similar image. Take a very good look at this fibrinous pericardial effusion. In the developing world, in places where TB and HIV are very common, this fibrinous pericardial effusion is almost always caused by tuberculosis. Look at the color of the pericardial effusion and you'll see that it is somewhat turbid. You can also see that the pericardial surfaces are somewhat thickened as well. Also note that the pleural and pericardial surface of the pericardium slide on one another, which becomes important when we talk about the next slide. Also note that there is no restriction of movement of the right ventricle, so this is not a case of tamponade. Also notice that the liver doesn't move with the beating of the heart, uh, which will also become important in the next slide. This is a gentleman that I remember well. He came into clinic and he was probably middle aged and he gave me a history of having tuberculosis in the past, but he couldn't remember finishing medicines more than three or four months. And he came in quite ill. He complained of a cough. He complained of shortness of breath and peripheral edema. I remember looking at him and thinking about, well, this is probably recurrence of his TB. In a worst case scenario, he probably has multi-drug resistant TB from not finishing his drug therapy. I decided to do a FASH exam on him. And when it came to imaging the heart, this is what I saw. If you look carefully at the video, you'll see that the intraventricular septum bounces back and forth. This is called a septal bounce and is literally pathognomonic for constrictive pericarditis. And constrictive pericarditis in the developing world in areas with high HIV TB prevalence is almost always due to tuberculosis. The Constrictum pericarditis is like a shell around the heart and causes problem with the heart filling. Actually, it causes biventricular filling defects. 
This is not like tamponade. Tamponade is pan-diastolic filling impairment, whereas constriction, there is resistance free early diastolic filling, so it's easy to differentiate. And of course, obviously, there's no fluid around the heart as you would see in tamponade. There are three things that are common in constrictive pericarditis. First is pericardial calcification or thickening of the pericardium, which makes image acquisition difficult. Now this image is not too bad, but I will tell you that it was hard to get this apical forechamber because of shadowing, and that was because of thickening of the pericardium. There's also rapid termination of diastole, and of course, the septal bounce, which is the most diagnostic finding in constrictive pericarditis. You remember in the last patient that there was free movement of the pleural and pericardial surface of the pericardium. Well, in this case, if you were to see the pericardium a little bit better, you'd see that they move as one and they don't rub on each other. And there's also no pericardial effusion. And as I mentioned in the last slide, that if you look carefully, that there's no movement of the liver or adjacent structures with the beating of the heart. But when there is adherence of one pericardial surface on the other, the adjacent structures also move in concert with the heart. This is another patient and a good example of constrictive pericarditis. Although looking for constrictive pericarditis is not really part of the FASH exam, finding it would certainly help to explain some of the symptoms, like in our previous patient, of shortness of breath and cough. This patient nicely demonstrates the septal bounce. The patient also demonstrates a thickened pericardial and pleural surface of the pericardium. And you can also see that the pericardium moves as one rather than the pleural and pericardial surfaces sliding on one another. There's a small suggestion or hint that perhaps the liver is bouncing or moving with the motion of the heart. I also didn't mention that in constrictive pericarditis that the IVC is almost always dilated and there's expiratory flow reversal in the hepatic veins. In part of this clip, you can see the slow blood flow motion in the hepatic vein. And if you look carefully, you can see reversal of the flow. The second part of the FASH exam is to look for abnormal lymphadenopathy. In extrapulmonary tuberculosis or disseminated tuberculosis, one of the easiest places to look for lymphadenopathy are the periaortic lymph nodes. On this video clip, you'll see at the bottom of the image the bony structure of the vertebral canal. Just above the bony vertebral canal, you'll see the aorta. And if you look carefully, you'll see the celiac axis coming out of the aorta. Now, the celiac axis doesn't look exactly normal, and that's because of the lymphadenopathy and especially the lymph nodes pressing on the celiac axis, giving a little bit of a different uh, look. All those structures around the celiac axis and abdominal aorta are actually abnormal lymph nodes. The last part of the FASH exam is to look for focal lesions in the liver or spleen. And these are described as microabscesses. This is a picture of the spleen on your right with the diaphragm and also a pleural effusion next to the diaphragm. If you look at the spleen without looking at it in video, in other words, just a JPEG clip, it's hard to differentiate anything from that spleen, which would be abnormal. However, if you look carefully at the video clip, you'll see small hypochoic areas spread throughout the spleen, which represent microabscesses and disseminated tuberculosis. Also, if you look carefully at the pleural effusion, you'll see that it does have some fibrous strands in it which makes it a fibrinous pleural effusion. So the fibrinous pleural effusion with the microabscesses of the spleen make it very likely that this is disseminated or extrapulmonary tuberculosis. Scanning in HIV disease and in tuberculosis is not limited to the FASH exam, and there are many other things that we can ascertain by scanning the patient with HIV disease. With HIV disease, malignancy is not uncommon, especially lymphoma. And that's fairly easy to see in the liver and spleen. You can also diagnose HIV nephropathy because the kidney itself becomes hyperechoic in its relationship to the liver and also enlarged, which is different than chronic renal disease. There are other areas where you might see tuberculous lymphadenopathy, especially in the neck and in the axilla. And of course, you can see other infectious processes 
of the liver and kidney, for example, PCP or PCJ, uh, pneumocystis gyrovicki, in the liver and kidney, which gives you a snowstorm looking appearance. Ultrasound can also be very valuable as an adjunct to the diagnosis and treatment of Chagas disease or American trypanosomiasis. Chagas can cause both acute and chronic problems which are amenable to examination by ultrasound. It can cause acute myocarditis and pericarditis and of course the feared complication of chronic ventricular apical aneurysms. This is a little girl that I saw some years ago who had acute Chagas disease and had collected the reduviate bugs and brought them with her to her clinic appointment for examination. Ultrasound is easy and capable of diagnosing intraperitoneal fluid or intraperitoneal hemorrhage in those patients with hemorrhagic fevers. Now we have used it fairly extensively in patients with dengue and I've also used it in patients with yellow fever to document fluid in Morrison's pouch as you see here in this patient. This is just a review of some of the other things we see in dengue patients. There is a positive tourniquet test on the arm that you can see on your left and of course the classic dengue rash that we see which we refer to as white islands on a red sea. This is another child with dengue fever showing how we measure the tourniquet test on her left arm. We also scanned her abdomen and found that she did have fluid in Morrison's pouch. She also had fluid in her right hemithorax, a pleural effusion, which is very common in children with dengue, although this x-ray is not from this patient. We often find right-sided pleural effusions and not bilateral pleural effusions for a reason that is not fully understood. Let's finish our topic today with the third category, which I think is perhaps the most interesting, and that is those diseases which we have scanned and we don't know whether the scans actually will help us in the future with uh, diagnosis and treatment. And then there are those diseases that no one has actually ever scanned. So we don't know if they're helpful or not, and we don't know whether ultrasound can be applied to them or not. But let me say one thing. If you are a parasite or a worm, we are coming for you, and we will find you, and we will scan you. Now let's look at a couple diseases that fall within this third or the unknown or unexplored utility category. We thought that it might be helpful in patients with leprosy to scan for thickened nerves, and we scanned this and many other patients. We did find that you can see the thickened nerve with the ultrasound, but it was actually much easier to feel it with your finger than it was to scan it. On the other hand, if you wanted to know whether the structure that you were feeling was a thickened nerve or not, then ultrasound was very helpful. This is a patient who had chronic leprosy who had really a fair degree of disability secondary to his leprosy. We felt that he had an enlarged sural nerve and scanning proved that it indeed was the sural nerve, but how this can be helpful in the diagnosis and management of leprosy in the future is still unknown. All of us who have worked for any time in the developing world know that there are patients who present to us who are quite ill and wasted, but the diagnosis is elusive. We just call this chronic wasting disease. This is a young woman who was actually referred to us by the tuberculosis clinic, wanting to know if we had any other thoughts or ideas about what her diagnosis may be. We did an HIV test on her, which was negative. We did sputums for AFP, which were also negative. So we were left with a very ill woman with no diagnosis. A chest X-ray did show that she had a large fibrinous pleural effusion. So tuberculosis or extrapulmonary tuberculosis was certainly high on our list. But at the end of the day, we still didn't know what she had and we referred her back to the TB clinic. Can ultrasound help us with this diagnosis of chronic wasting disease in the future? The answer is unknown at this point. This is a beautiful video clip that was forwarded to me by one of my colleagues, Francesca Tamarazzi, and she had spent a fair amount of time in West Africa scanning patients with onchocerciasis. This is a picture of an onchocercoma and she had put her linear transducer over it for some period of time. And if you look very carefully, you can see a little bit of movement of the worm inside the onchocercoma. Of course, you can also feel it with your fingers and see it with your eyes as well. Is ultrasound actually helpful or valuable in the diagnosis of an onchocercoma? Again, that still remains to be answered. This is one of my former fellows who is doing foot care on a patient with lymphedema secondary to lymphatic filariasis. Now it's been well described in the literature that there is a filarial dance within 
filarial nests of worms. I will admit that I've looked very often in the scrotal areas for filarial nests, and I have yet to find one. So the question is, how useful is finding a filarial nest in the diagnosis of lymphatic filariasis, and how common is it? And I think both those questions still need to be answered. It has been well described that there is a significant amount of hypersplenism in children in areas of high incidence of malaria. I have scanned many of these children myself, and many of the children I have scanned are also in areas with visceral leishmaniasis. We've done RK39 tests on these children in Asia to rule out leishmaniasis. Then the question remains is how useful is it to scan and measure these spleens in children in areas with a high incidence of malaria and hypertrophic spondylomegaly syndrome. This is a child that I know well with tropical hypersplenism syndrome. I have followed him for several years, and this is after my first year after having treated him. With the ultrasound, I could document that the spleen was reduced in size, that his hemoglobin was a little bit better, and he still was better than previously, but still looked a little sick. I have followed him each year and have documented that his spleen has shrunk year after year. But how useful really is the ultrasound? Because I can also document that just by measuring the spleen using my physical exam with my hands. I think the answer to that is still unknown. Well, this is a disease that we had high hopes for for the ultrasound. This is mycetoma or Madura foot. And this is a young man's foot who I have followed for several years. And he has been treated for several years. And it's been remarkable that he has gotten significantly better. We had hoped to be able to put the linear transducer over the lesion and be able to see these little granules that are spit out of the wound. If you remember that they have little white or black granules or sometimes they're yellow or brown granules that are spit out of these wounds, which is quite characteristic of mycetoma. If you look at the video clip, there is some hint of little hyperechoic areas as part of this lesion. However, can we make the diagnosis or can it help us follow the patient? I think those questions at this point still remain unanswered. This is a tropical ulcer that we are debriding. And the question becomes, is this a Borrelia ulcer caused by Mycobacteria ulcerans, or is it just a normal tropical ulcer? If you remember in Borrelia ulcer, as you debreed, there's undermining of the edges. And sometimes you can take a forceps or hemostat in your debridement, and the forceps or hemostat will actually go underneath the wound quite a distance. We scanned both Borrelia ulcers and regular tropical ulcers, seeing if we could determine any difference in the ultrasound image or pattern. And at this point, I would have to say, after having scanned a fair number of these, there doesn't seem to be any distinguishing characteristic between the microbacteria ulcerans and regular tropical ulcers. So this is an area also that needs more investigation. I remember this patient well. It was the first time I had ever seen an aconococcal cyst in the lung by ultrasound. This was quite a large cyst, and we had to use a echo window to see the cyst since it laid just to the right of the pericardium. Now, we use ultrasound all the time to diagnose aconococcus of the liver and other organs, but we don't use it very often to see aconococcus of the lung. So what is the utility of ultrasound in diagnosing aconococcal cysts of the lung? The answer is we just don't know. It needs more investigation. Well, we have scanned the world for you. This is the border of Bangladesh and Myanmar in the tribal areas. Base camp on Mount Everest. We're checking to see how the ultrasound functions at low temperatures and how the gel functions at low temperatures. And we're also looking for subclinical pulmonary edema in climbers. Bangladesh Delta, and no, this is not a pregnancy. This is the Sahel Desert in West Africa. What happens when you try to scan patients over 114 degrees Fahrenheit? And what happens when you try to power your ultrasound with solar panel and batteries? Rural Southern Cambodia, no electricity and very little follow-up care or specialty care. Rural Belize and a woman who described what we thought was a retinal detachment and an ophthalmologist who was many hours away. Rural West Africa, I'm doing a first trimester scan and a woman who turned out to have triplets. What do we advise her when she gets near delivery time, when the nearest hospital that can deliver triplets safely is a 14-hour, very rough and very long trip to a capital city? teaching ultrasound in the Social Security Hospital in Panama City, Panama. Scanning a man who was brought to us on a stretcher in South Asia who had a history of pulmonary tuberculosis and a very positive FASH exam for extrapulmonary or disseminated tuberculosis.
he had sputum negative, but made it very clear to us that he was not going to go back to the tuberculosis clinic. Follow-up post-operative scan on a patient that we had diagnosed earlier with a liver abscess. We have scanned the world for you, and we have categorized the things that we found and put them into a curriculum. We have presented to you the things that we know, the things that we think we know, and the things that we don't yet understand or know. And we think that this curriculum and this categorization is a good place to start. Let's all try to go where no man or no woman has ever gone before so that we can all do this just a little bit better. Mm -hmm.